Hi everyone. How y'all doing? Pretty well. So, uh, are we pumped about this uh, this Mars landing today? That's uh, seems to be like a pretty big deal. Um, I'm gonna be watching. Although it's gonna happen, it's gonna happen like almost literally at the last minute of class. So, if you bail out, I won't be offended. But uh, I think it's, I think it's, I think they said it was literally happening at 3:55. Um, but I'm not sure if that includes, there's like this 11, 11 minute light delay. So I'm not sure if that means it happens at 355 on Mars or like we hear about it at 355, but yeah. Um, so yeah, I'd watch that if I were you. Um, seems like, seems like a pretty cool deal. Uh, although I don't know if there's much to see other than just like it worked, it didn't blow up, but that's, that's good. That's a good step, I'd say. Um, so, uh. All right, uh, let's let's jump into it here. So we have a chat. Are we recording? I think. Where can we watch? Good question. Um, I think uh, so. NASA, there's like NASA TV. I assume if I mean if you just Google NASA TV, I'm sure it'll be like the first thing that the NASA PR people are like in like full full overdrive right now. Um, yeah, I, I would just search for NASA TV. There's like a cool. Uh, if you go to i, I think it's eyes.nasa.com or gov, I guess. Um, they have like a thing where you can actually go through and simulate the like the the mission. Um, it has like a fairly detailed three D rendering of like the entire descent and all the different steps that they have. Like at some point, they like break off from the parachute and like have a uh, some rockets that sort of hover it down and then they lower it down. So uh, you can do that too. Um, but I, yeah, but I think it's just like NASA TV. They're like main mainstream there. Um, yeah. Okay, so. Maybe I could even, I could just open it up here and we could just hang out and watch it at the end too. That's an option. Um, so, uh, all right, so let's, let's, okay. Uh, so let's get down to some economics here. Um, I mean, this is, you know, we're, we're, we're focused on technology, I think. I mean, we're kind of in, in the, in a, in a, another tangent right now, but you know, I think at the end of the day, this is a pretty technology oriented course and it'll kind of get more so as time goes on. So, um, it's good to, good to keep track of the various, Developments and I think I mean this this the stuff with any any of the space exploration stuff is probably going to be more long term, you know, possibly hopefully useful someday in the future. But it, it's more like akin to basic R and D, right? So, but we'll talk about sort of different, um, you know, how, how to think about that kind of stuff, like basic versus applied R and D, and and how how what are the incentives for that? How is it funded? Um, Bit later, okay. Some of it's, a lot of it's going to be focused on a little bit looking historically at the internet, but um, and the development of the internet. But we'll, we'll kind of get into those topics, okay? Um, all right. So, so, but for now, though, we're we're kind of focused on this these issues of causality, okay? Um, so this is a little bit more related. I mean, it's it's important in any field of economics. I think it's a little bit more based in statistics and econometrics in some sense. Um, but it's uh, yeah, I mean it's it's broadly applicable. Okay, so we're we're and we're going to be thinking about kind of macro applications in a lot of ways. All right, so um, yeah, so the last time we were looking at this basically, um, so we were talking about about how to sort of untangle things, how to infer uh, uh, causality just from like looking at the world. Okay, so and we kind of so the the main thing. We hit upon which, which is more or less a formalization of the old saw that correlation is not causality. Uh, the main thing we touched upon is is you know you need some way to to essentially create what I would say like create independent variation to then see what happens. So you need to you need some way to like sort of simulate running an experiment in in this instead of actually running an experiment, which is more or less impossible at the macro scale. All right, so um, and that's what people call this this natural experiment. Okay, so sometimes um, there's a couple different terms for this kind of thing. Uh, so sometimes and they they kind of vary in like how descriptive they are. I would say so. Like natural experiment is one which is pretty. It's relatively clear making an analogy to an actual scientific experiment, but saying it's a, it's a natural historical one. Um, and uh, yeah, but sometimes people will say like instrumental variables or instrument, okay? So when they say that, that's a little bit more technical econometrics, but it's, when they say instrument, what they're talking about is like this bubble in particular. So that historical factor is like your instrument, I guess it's like the thing that you're creating variation with or inferring variation with. 
um, that sort of historical factor, maybe something about colonialism, as we'll see, induces variation in your, your object of sort of interest, like a policy or something, and then uh, potentially in um, your your outcome variable, like GDP growth or something like that. Okay, so, but the instrument, the, the sort of, the ideal instrument, if it is sort of, if it actually works, is one that influences, say, your policy, but doesn't influence your outcome variable. Okay, so that you can get a clean uh, measurement of this line x to y, which is the thing that we're actually interested in. How well does that policy work? Okay, um, all right, so that's that's the, the, the general approach to either natural experiment or instrumental variable, which I'm going to kind of use interchangeably at this point. Okay, um, but we can get we can get more specific. Okay, and this is going to be a specific. This is an example that is going to be talked about more in Jim McGlynn and Robinson. The I mean, Why Nations Fail book, um, and which also sort of is, it, 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 there's a paper uh, that they have I, by Gemma Glenn Robinson as well um, called The Colonial Origins of, of Growth or something like that, where they, where they focus in exactly on this, right? And so they kind of, a lot of economists, they'll, you know, we're, we're supposed to write papers and, and we, we do. Um, so they'll, they'll write a bunch of papers and the, as they get older, they, they sort of synthesize those into books, depending on sort of how much they're feeling like going towards the public intellectual direction, right? So so this is kind of an outgrowth of a couple different papers that they had and they want to say, okay, here's a general thesis. Hopefully we can make it a little more accessible to to my, the general public too. Um, so so that's, that's kind of what their approach was, but this is one of their big sort of headline uh, papers that they had. Okay, so, but the the basic idea here is to use differences in how this, these colonial institutions or these colonial setups were arranged, um, and see if that has an effect on on uh, economic outcomes in in the long run. Okay, so part of the the critical thing here is is the persistence, I guess. So it's not just that like okay, we we have this highly extractive colonial institution. And that country doesn't do well under this highly extractive colonial institution. So, well, maybe that was obvious, but what they also want to know is how persistent are these institutions? How how persistent are the effects of them? Okay, so they're looking at outcomes today, or not today, but in, in say the twentieth century or the latter half of the twentieth century for the most part, because partially that's also where we have the best data. Okay, so it's it's easier to look at that. Um, okay, so then so what they're doing is. Um, well, yeah, okay, so we're, we actually, I had the, I'll, I'll show you the data on this, okay, so so at some point, you know, we want to actually bring this to the data, so we do have kind of data on each of these bubbles, okay, so we'll, we'll do that in a minute, okay, but I do want to kind of just talk about um, this, uh, uh, I guess it's sort of like colonial origins uh, instrument, okay, so it's, it's a particular approach, okay, my iPad's being a little slow here, um, yeah, okay. There, there's there's some lag issues that we've been having, um, but hopefully it'll, it'll work out. Okay, so but essentially what they're what they're pushing is um, the, their instrument. Okay, that historical experiment variable. I'll write it down here. Is going to be uh, the settler mortality. Okay. Okay, the lag's pretty good. Okay, so so this is the thing I was talking about last time, where it's like the European uh, you know, officials or um, merchants or whatever, whoever they are, uh, or missionaries, oftentimes were the first people to to Europeans to go particular places, um, go there, and they they just experience very high rates of mortality, usually from disease. Okay, so they get a fever and they don't really know what it is, but they end up dying. Okay, so um, and that's that's sort of to be expected anytime you have uh, anytime you go to a place that hasn't. Been in, in long, long, hasn't uh, been in contact. Uh, the populations haven't been in contact with each other. Okay, so that happens. Okay, and so this is at that time. So this is like in the 1800s, for instance, uh, or the 1700s, or even earlier. Okay, so um, actually, I mean, it would be largely 1700s and earlier. Okay, so um, so this is the the instrument. Okay, and then the what we're we're kind of. The question, or like the, the the first impact, okay, is that settler mortality is going to have some uh, effect on these institutions. So I call it property rights in the in the slides, okay. So you could also, if you want to use, um, 
the terminology from why nations fail, you could you could say it's more like an extractive, inclusive uh, kind of thing. But 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 in terms of how we measure it, okay, it's going to be it, we're going to look at sort of like protection of property rights, so protection from expropriation by uh, either a government or, or another party. Okay, um, and I guess yeah. So I mean, if if it's extractive, you it's it's more like there's there's not that much protection of property rights. Okay, because you you go out there and like, oh, I found a, a vein of silver in the hills here, uh, and the government finds out about it, and they're like, oh, actually, that's ours now. Okay, so um, that would be extractive, right? And then if you think about it, that, that can mess up a lot of economic incentives for, for a variety of things, okay? Um, and then inclusive would be, you, know, you, you don't, it doesn't get expropriated by the government, okay? So, um, and it, it, maybe it's the government, maybe it's just someone who's, who has, who's, in good on good terms with the government, you know, another party, right? So those are going to be similar in this case. All right. So so that's the the institutional effect. Okay. And then the question is, well, the the the, the final output is that wasn't this this whole bubble was a disaster. Let's start over. Okay. So the final output is going to be economic growth today. Okay. So I'm, I'm going to differentiate between today and like his, like modern day and historical, okay? Modern economic growth, say in the 20th century, okay? So that's going to be the final output. So in a in a high level schematic sense, okay, we're we're kind of we can just think about it like that, okay? And then there's the question of this is supposed to be a dotted line, okay? There's the question of well, is that is that a link, okay? And when I, I guess when I write a dotted line, I'm gonna, I sort of mean maybe, okay. In this case, hopefully not, okay. Uh, right. So then the, the so the, okay. So then this would be our this settler mortality is gonna be our instrument, okay. And the, the what we want and what they what they would say is is that we want it to be a valid instrument or like if it's a valid instrument, then it, it, it is useful to us, okay. Um, and it, for it to be a valid instrument, we need those two things. We need it to ha actually have some impact, which is to say that this arrow here, uh, going from settler mortality to extractive um, inclusive institutions, this arrow exists, okay, uh, and is, is sort of meaningfully there, okay? So then that means that it, it actually is the case that uh, settler mortality influences the types of institutions that are implemented in these country in these colonies and then later on countries okay um you and then so this is the thing we're measuring we don't really have to assume anything about this right hand side arrow it's just this is we'll, we'll get an answer hopefully all right um which will tell us about the effect of institutions on economic growth all right and then this is the, the other thing is we want this not to be an arrow okay we don't want settler mentality to influence growth because then if we say if we look at this regression well it could be that there's some direct effect of institutions on growth or it could just be, kind of obviously, that mortality is bad for growth. Okay, which is like, you might think you might think that this this setup is sort of laughable, right, in the first place. Because well, wouldn't this be an arrow? Okay, so so the first thing you need to get past is like, well, why is this? Why do we think this would not be an arrow? Okay, um, and to do that, I mean, I think you you really have to unpack this this. You you need to add more bubbles, basically. Okay, so. We're gonna add more bubbles. All right. Um, you need to unpack these things. Okay, into modern historical, modern historical here, and then we can get more detailed. Okay. And what do I mean by that? So, <clears throat> to what I mean is is settle mortality. I didn't kind of imply that it was, you know, historical, right? So, but but let's break it into. Um, well, okay. So let's let's do settler. Mortality, mortality, uh, historical, I guess. Okay, so this is a thing that we can measure, right? You see in the records how frequently settlers died. Okay, that's that's a thing. Um, all right, and that's going to be now. Now, this is where we want to differentiate a little bit, which is to say we might want to think about um, just overall. Mortality, say from disease, uh, you know, modern in the modern day. Okay, so it, it turns out that um, these aren't super well linked. Okay, 
then that's going to be what sort of saves us, right? It turns out that um, the historical setter mortality really was due to uh, lack of exposure to some of the diseases that they were they were seeing there. Okay, um, and then the people living the the people that were already living there, the indigenous peoples, uh, they already had immunity for the most part. I mean, of course, disease happened, but they they already had strong immunity to that. And then in the modern era, people that are living in those same places also had immunity to a certain level, right, for these diseases. Okay, so this link isn't so strong. So then, and then if you think about, here's economic growth, modern. Okay, that's a, that's that's our, our, our outcome bubble we had last time. So this thing exists, of course, right? It's, it's mortality in the modern era is bad for economic growth because of, of a wide variety of reasons. We, you know, there have been studies on this. Uh, if you think about, you know, malaria would probably be one of the bigger ones. Um, AIDS, you know, major diseases, deadly diseases. Okay, and then of course we know um, with COVID and everything like that. So, um, yeah, that that's a clear link. Okay, it's just that that the going from historical sediment mortality doesn't really cor correlate that strongly with modern mortality. And so, so we're kind of, there's no link, there's no path from here to here, right? Even though this link exists, there, uh, sorry, even though this link exists, there's no path from subtle mortality historical to economic growth modern, which is kind of good enough for us, right? Okay, so let's fill in the other stuff. So we have, like before, we have um, subtle mortality is going to affect, uh, let, let's just call it institutions. That, that's, I'm, I'm replacing extractive inclusive which is institutions historical okay we're gonna have a good number of bubbles here so get get ready all right well actually only only really two more okay so uh institutions historical okay that's going to be that dynamic where if you have high settler mortality uh the the colonial powers will tend to in implement extractive institutions because they're just kind of they just want to go in there and, and get as much as many resources as they can and get out, I guess. All right, so um, that's that's the, the channel there, okay? And before we had a link, we had a line going from these institutions to economic uh, growth. We, we can unpack that too a little, all right, in the sense of, well, those are historical institutions, okay? Um, and then we have institutions modern. So I'm really just breaking things into historical and modern this with this expansion okay uh, modern institutions okay and then you might think that so, so then the, the final arrow would be okay well modern institutions are surely somehow going to affect economic growth the question is how right is this you know kind of plus or minus or, or whatever or zero okay so that's the quite that's the thing we want to answer that final era of institute how do modern institutions affect economic growth and in some sense we're interested in this too sort of how persistent are these institutions right if you have extractive institutions implemented then sort of how persistent are those what's the what's the likelihood that they're going to continue to show up uh be, be kind of um uh active in in the modern era okay and then the second element to that that chain is is how do those modern institutions affect economic growth Okay, so so that and so if you this is the more complex model, like this is like a, a potential model of the world. Okay, this is saying it potentially be true. Um, this reduces to the one we saw before, right? In the sense that there is a path going from settler mortality to institutions, and there's a path going from institutions historical to, to modern economic growth. Okay, so before we just had these three. Okay, but it's still the case that there's a path going from here to here, and there's a path going from institutions to growth through this persistence channel. And it's still the case that there's not a path uh, other than this one going from set mortality to economic growth because this, this link here is not so strong, okay? So that, that's the basic idea is that you can create and think about more complex models, and then they'll, you know, you can kind of reduce them or thinking about, think about them being reduced to, to the simpler models, but you know, in some sense, you want to, you could always make a more complex model, or you could always add additional bubbles, arrows, whatever. But you know, this is this is a pretty good, you know, place to to I think stop this complexification process in the sense that I think we have enough here. 
All right. So, um, yeah. Okay. So then, so, so that, so the, but the whole question, the whole thing here is we're, we're, we're reasoning about the instrument, which is this thing here, this, this mortality instrument. We're, we're reasoning about this instrument and if it's valid. Okay. And the two things we need are, um, kind of, it has, it has this, uh, this channel here, uh, from settled mortality to institutions. Okay. And that there's no link here between settled mortality and growth directly. Okay. That the only link there is a path, right? But it, the, we want it only to go through this channel that we're interested in. Okay. Because if this thing existed, well, it would just be that these places with historical center mortality had modern mortality and that's bad for growth. But we, we want this not to exist and, and so we can pick up the effect through here. Okay, that's that's the approach. Okay, so we've been reasoning graphically with that. Okay, and then the, the, the what you do after that is you actually get some data on this, right? So if, if we couldn't get data on it, then I mean, maybe it'd be an interesting thought exercise, but the, there would be no hope of actually answering any questions about it. Okay, so well, we can get data on this. We can get data on basically all of these. Okay, so we're going to look at, um, in the paper, they I think they do look at all these. Okay, so, uh, but we're going to look at, um, basically, we're going to look at center mortality, this link. Okay, and the way I'm going to do it is, e I'm going to give you different plots that are going to look at two-way relationships. Okay, at a country level. They'll look at this relationship between set of mortality and institutions, and then they'll look at the relationship between institutions and, and growth. Okay. All right, so yeah, so for the data, and here, here's the original graph we had. So so for the data, um, you know, so these are these are two way relationships where they're scatter plots and, and the the you know, so this line here is some regression line. Okay, so this this is going to give us a notion of the the, co the statistical correlation between these two things. Okay, um, and now each, I feel a little, there's two things. First, it's a little small. Second, sometimes there's clustering of these countries. And third, you might not know, and I might not know necessarily what uh, each of these countries is, but each country basically has a three-letter ISO code associated with it. Um, you know, uh, okay, so Hong Kong, HKG, uh, Nicaragua, and I see GHA is Ghana. Some of them are fairly obvious. Um, Nigeria, um, Haiti. So, I mean, like Jamaica, you can kind of piece together Gambia, um, Mali. So like, um, and then here you have, you know, Australia, New Zealand, sort of the, the, the kind of what we call Western offshoots and so on. Okay. So, um, a bunch of different countries, right. In different, uh, continents. I mean, basically the Americas, North and South and Africa, uh, and some in Asia. So I guess Singapore, Hong Kong, that might be it. Okay. So, um, although the Philippines, I don't know how the Philippines is treated here. Uh, they may be here. So, okay. So, um, so you have a, and, and I guess Pakistan. So, so you have all these countries, um, here, all right. Of course, the different size countries are, are treated the same, but you know, that's okay. Uh, for our purposes. And on the x-axis, we have that settler mortality. Okay, so this is, well, this is log. Settler mortality this is like a, a rate of mortality for settlers on a yearly basis, right? Um, so it's, it's appropriate normalized and everything like that. Um, and then you have some measure of the institutions. Okay, so here, we're, this is really confusing. I never liked this y-axis, but it says, it says average expropriation risk, but it's actually protection against expropriation. So so basically the higher the number is here, the stronger the property rights are, okay? So the more kind of inclusive, so these are up here are more inclusive and down here are more extractive, okay? Um, so uh, you can see that there's, there's relationship, basically that the higher the set of mortality, the, the lower this property rights index is, and so it's it's more extractive, okay? Now, again, this this, this is an index, okay? This is, you know, so it's a little subjective. It's not like a probability necessarily or anything like that. It's just like they look at <clears throat> historical records and try and assess uh, how often expropriation happened, what legal protections there were and everything like that. So that's, it's, it's clearly subjective, um, but I mean, at some point you sort of have to, uh, you have to trust these numbers, okay? So, um, so that's the first that first error they've had that relationship between settled mortality 
and these institutions. Okay, and that that holds up, and it it and it, it kind of goes in the direction that the story that they're pushing of of higher settler mortality being more extractive institutions. Right. Okay, so. Um, the, that, then what we can do is look at that second part, all right, which is the relationship between these institutions. Now they're on the x-axis, okay, and this, you know, log GDP per capita. This is a modern, um, well, actually, so here I, I wrote economic growth before. I, I guess I should say economic performance of some sort. So this is just looking at the GDP per capita. This is more of a level, right? I mean, probably it's also true in, the, in a growth sense, but this is more of a level of of economic output or uh, consumption okay so yeah um and here you know it's just a log logarithmic scale okay um and you can see that the countries that have more protection okay against uh corporation risk um have higher gdp per capita okay so and you can see the usa uh i yeah i mean it's it's probably indexed in such a way that the USA is, is the top. Um, US, again, the USA doesn't always have to be the top. Oftentimes it ends up being USA and Lex Luxembourg is in the mix with their super high GDP per capita. So, um, but you can see that there's obviously a clustering here like USA, Canada, Australia, and New Zealand, right? So, um, so that's that second part, okay? Now, um, so, so this means, uh, that there's sort of this, you know, I mean, so, so the, this is sort of suggestive that their story kind of holds up. Okay, you, you can see this expropriation risk. I mean, to really do the analysis, you need to like run um, <clears throat> a particular regression. Okay, you need to, and, and, the, and the basic idea there is uh, you wanna, the, the cell mortality is inducing changes in, um, in this case, expropriation risk. Okay, and then the expropriation risk is inducing changes potentially in, in GDP per capita. And there's, I mean, there's a way to, to run the regression to kind of get, get the true effect of, of expropriation risk. Okay, so um, because, you know, expropriation risk varies for other reasons, I guess is what I would say. Um, sometimes they're just random, okay? Uh, so you, you need to sort of properly control for things, okay? And, and you need to control for other, you know, uh, climactic and things like that factors. Okay, so th there's a little bit more under the hood here, but but the essential idea is that, that you can run a regression to, to sort of pick this up. Okay, but you can, it, but it's it's um not like a naive regression. Okay, so it, it'll it'll pick up the true effect basically. Okay, and how to do that is more for econometrics class, but you know it, it's possible. Okay, so you can do that, and they find they find this positive effect, and that's what the whole paper is is talking about. Is is this you know long run, not just the effect, but also the fact that these institutions were implemented historically and they were they persisted to today and then uh, had this impact. Okay, so it's it's both sort of that institutions matter, but also that they're very persistent. So institutions are very persistent, and since they matter, economic performance is very persistent. Okay, and so that's it's sort of a a mechanism by which you can get this 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 lack of convergence across countries. Okay, persistent success for, or or not. Okay, um, that's the basic idea. Okay, so, well, that's all well and good. Um, I guess, the, I mean, you, you look at these plots, okay, and especially in this case, look at, at this scatter plot. I mean, you can see U.S., Canada, Australia, New Zealand all completely sealed off here, and then Singapore is kind of there too, okay? I mean, they're, they're all at uh, the high end for expropriation rates and the high end for GDP per capita, Okay. Um, probably, I mean, that I think should make one worry that this, that that's, there's some other factors here. Okay. Um, and I mean, I, I would, I think, well, first of all, uh, yeah, I mean the, the major factor you would think would be something like, um, I mean, essentially the, the, these countries are the ones that had the highest, uh, number of settlers going to right so um you know the usa i mean so, so in, in the case of australia new zealand canada usa of course there were indigenous people there um but then if you look at the countries today most of the people there are you know not indigenous people and not descended from indigenous people okay so that's a big difference and you might think there's many reasons why you could think that matters i mean that's going to affect how, that first of all there's there's differences in sort of 
human capital, right? So the people coming over had different uh, human capital. They, they probably um, uh, had different levels of, of education and things like that. Um, and that's going to, and it also influences how these countries interact with the rest of the world. Right? I mean, it's going to, it's going to influence whether they're given favorable trading terms and stuff like that. Right. So, um, and you know, some of it is sort of racially motivated. Some of it maybe not, I don't know, but it's, it's certainly going to, it's going to influence how they interact with the rest of the world, which influences the fate of a country. Right. So there's like a bunch of reasons why you might think that the, the fraction of that country that ultimately comes from settlers uh, and European settlers is important. Okay, so now it's it's true. I mean, like Singapore, you know, that's that's a very ethnically uh, heterogeneous country um, to some extent. Hong Kong, true as well. And, and most people in Hong Kong are not, um, you know, European settlers. Okay, or descended from European settlers. So there's certainly that's not like 100 percent of the story, but that's a factor. Okay, so. I guess what I'm saying is, you know, you want to be aware of these factors because that, you know, that 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 could sort of undo a story that someone is telling. Okay, you want to, so so they're saying, right, that it's all about settlement mortality influencing these colonial institutions, which influences economic growth, but there could be other stories. Okay, um, so now that now. The, what they the, so this is a common sort of refrain, okay? It's just that, um, and, and it and it and it kind of comes just back to like comes back to sort of like this, you know. Well, you, you know, certain countries were richer originally, and they they continue to be so, okay? So, um, this is a common refrain, and and what what they often say is like, you know, there there's certain there's variation even within that story, okay? So if you think about a country like Colombia, okay, so in in uh, in South America, there's very there's a lot of variation in. Um, what fraction of people today are descended from indigenous people versus European settlers, right? So that in Colombia, um, I think it's it's uh, a large fraction are descended from European settlers, okay? Uh, but Colombia has, I mean, they've had a lot of political instability and economically their their performance has not been that good. It hasn't been um, kind of up in the, the region that we're seeing with USA, uh, Australia, and Canada. Okay, so that's sort of like, you know, you know, it's, they're, 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 this this uh, fraction of European settlers thing doesn't explain everything. Okay, so maybe it's not a big confounder there. Okay, um, and I guess the but but then you you know you could think about other stuff, but the the size okay the of available land area. So certainly Australia, U.S. and Canada have a ton of you know just land available. Okay, but you know that's also true for Brazil, um, and it's not true for New Zealand. Okay, so so I guess the thing is like you can think of other correlates. Right, that could um, influence this story, and 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 if you're thinking about, um, let's go back to the iPad. So if you're thinking about other correlates, okay, that that might sort of cause issues, okay. So um, let's see, uh, you, you can you can incorporate that into a graph like this, okay. So we're gonna add even more bubbles, all right. Things can get a little wild, okay, but. Um, you can incorporate that here, and essentially what you'd say is, um, let's see. So settlement mortality is our original thing, our original story. Okay, so may maybe okay, we we could add another bubble, which would be like, you know, sort of the scale of European migration. Okay, um, all right. And so that's that's a thing, and maybe that that might affect institutions. Okay, so if you think, if if you have a large fraction of people immigrating from Europe, maybe they bring their institutions with them. Maybe interactions between you know, you, there's sort of different political interactions. Okay, um, and uh, over time, you know, historically, more in the modern sense, um, and also there, you know, there there's human capital. People are bringing human capital, especially sort of like technologies. Uh, maybe they're more connected. You know, if you, if you think about the case of England and the Industrial Revolution, perhaps people coming from England are more connected in in a real in real time uh, to to the new technologies arising in England, and that could diffuse faster. Okay, so you can think of a bunch of reasons um, why this might matter, um, and so and and that's something that might affect you know either institutions uh, or economic growth. Okay, all right. It's not clear as positive or negative. 
ex ante, all right? But it's something that could that could influence with those things. Okay, so it, if you start adding in arrows, that can the machine can break down. Okay, so so the critical thing before was that there was only one path uh, here between total mortality and economic growth, and it ran along um, the top here on the, on the sides, right? So it went through mortality, institutions, historical institutions, modern economic growth. If you add in other paths, European migration, land area, stuff like that, um, then there's a bunch of paths. And you know, if you think, if you look here, there's a path for the European migration to modern economic growth. Okay, so in probably the other, there's probably other intermediate channels, you know, in here that are producing that. Okay, but but there there are other paths. Okay, and that that kind of throws everything in disarray. Okay, if that's actually the case, then when you run a regression, you're picking up not just you know this original path that we were interested in, but also like this path here. Okay, so you're picking up a bunch of stuff. And all you're seeing is the combined effect of those, okay? And that's not that's not what we care about. Okay, we care about we're we're, we're interested in isolating specific effects so we can understand them. Okay, maybe you care about that, but you know the 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 original statement of purpose here was to figure out the effect of institutions. Okay. Um, okay. So then, yeah, and I mean. Yeah, so I guess I mean this is this okay. This turned into a real wild diagram, but um, yeah. So I so I guess what I wanted to say is first, okay, what is what is an instrument? How do we assess its validity? Okay, we can think, we can reason through it graphically. Uh, how do we do? How do we kind of conceptually run run an analysis in the data to to verify this? Okay, I didn't tell you how to do it per se, but I told you like how you think about doing it. Um, and the other thing is what can go wrong. Okay. What do you need to worry about? And it and it's it's kind of like you know it, there's there's confounding factors. Okay, you need to worry about confounding factors when you look at this data. Okay, and you see you know Australia, you know, uh, USA, Canada, New Zealand, Singapore, all up in there in the top right. High, you know you know sort of distinct from the rest. You might start to worry. There's other factors. Okay, that are separating those um, countries. Okay, but you know maybe maybe you could say okay, well let's. Just ignore those countries for, you know, let's just look at this area. I mean, even, even within here, there's a positive relationship. Okay. So maybe, maybe there's other things going on here. Okay. Um, but, but if, if, if only just, um, geograph uh, your, which continent you're on. Okay. If you only looked at within South America or within Africa, you would probably see a similar trend. Okay. So, so there's, you know, you, even if you're worried about that, you can control for it and say, okay, well, within a particular region, okay, this still seems to be true. And, and maybe that's a good way to approach things. But the, but essentially what you're doing there is you're controlling for other factors, okay? So you're controlling for sort of high level geographic factors or climactic factors, okay? That um, might separate, um, uh, say North and South America or something like that. Okay, so um, yeah, it, it's, uh, it, it's an art, okay, right? I mean, you, you can always come up with confounding factors and propose them and, and and to you know add infinitum uh at some point you need to stop and, and 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 just call it a day but uh you also do want to be very self-critical right and, and make sure you don't convince yourself of something that's not true okay um yeah all right so then okay that, that's basically what i drew um so so now that that's one approach okay and that's that's what's called the instrumental variables approach or the natural experiment approach okay and and that report, I mean that uh, uh, really what that was though is you're sort of running this particular type of regression, okay? Um, there's other ways you can look at this, all right? Um, there's then the there there's uh, not this specific topic, but there's other kind of general types of approaches that you can take. Um, that and this you know and the, it depends on what type of data you have and what type of problem you're looking at, okay? So. Um, but but I mean I think th these can be useful in in a wide variety of settings. Okay, anytime you you are sort of dealing with kind of observational data and you want to actually infer a causal relationship, most of the time you want to do that because you want to figure out what to do next. Okay, you want to figure out okay, here's this policy that some states implemented. Is it that just states that are doing well economically implemented the policy, or is it that this, the policy caused the states to to perform well? Okay. And then the big question you want to know is, should other states implement that, right? 
And to answer that question, you need to get a direct causal estimate of the impact of that policy. So that, that's why we would do something like this, this instrumental vary approach, is to, to get causality so that we can give sort of unbiased advice. Okay, so it could be that you're a policymaker. It could be that you are, um, you know, in a, say, a corporate environment or a nonprofit environment where, where you, you also are looking at observational data and trying to assess performance. Okay, um, so yeah, so that, that that's why you would do something like this. Okay, um, and and sometimes, you know, I I I didn't mention. Maybe I should have mentioned this before. I mean, sometimes you can kind of try to to. Um, get causality using the temporal structure of things. Okay, so it might be that, um, you know, different states implemented different policies, but they did so at different times. Okay, and so you can look at like, the, you know, this state implemented some, you know, say, uh, unemployment insurance policy first, and then look at what happened to them, and different states came later or earlier. And, and use that temporal variation to try and figure it out. Okay, so if, if they, what I'm saying is if they all do it at once, this policy, it might be that there was another thing that was happening in that time that that just is confounding your, your analysis. Okay, so there was, you know, like with Texas, right? There was just a big, you know, disaster in Texas or something, like a storm across the whole US. And if that happens at the same time as your policy, well, it's gonna totally confound it, okay? Or you could think about like Hurricane Katrina was another like big thing, right? Um, that, that had long, lasting effects and everything like that. Okay, so there's always stuff going on that's gonna mess up an analysis where you just have like one time data point. But if different things happen, if, if, if you have different, say, states doing these policies at implementing them at different times over the, over the years, well, then the, the probability that it's going to get confounded is a little less. OK. Um, now, there's issues with that, too, because it might just be that states like kind of that that are more have higher state capacity or they their economy is doing better, implement the policy earlier. And maybe that's a problem okay so there's still sort of what we would call endogeneity issues um with that but that that's an approach okay um that you could take um all right and another one which which is interesting i think another type of approach to this type this kind of problem is uh what's called like a, a discontinuity study all right okay and this is one that's also referenced in etchamogul and robinson okay so there's a pretty well-known study by uh, uh, Melissa Dell looking at this MITAS uh, setup that they had um, in, in South America. So it's mostly, I think, in Peru, okay? Uh, where they, where you basically, they, this was where they, they had the silver mines and the Spanish basically said, okay, you need to get 10% of your people to work for us for part of the year, okay? So it's, I mean, basically forced labor, okay? Um, uh, at this at this sort of communal level, right? Um, and then they were looking at sort of what the the long run effects of that are. Okay, so and you but you so there's a bunch of like you know that's going to have negative effects on the community. Okay, which are going to have negative effects right then and there in terms of income, nutrition, mortality, all of that. Um, and then the the question is how how persistent are those effects? Okay, so um, that's an and so. They wanted to figure out the effect of, of this this Mitas system in the long run, and and in and that, and that case, they actually used this discontinuity study. Okay, and, and kind of the reason the the reason that well, there's there's two there's there's two directions. There's sort of a supply and a demand thing. Okay, so in this case, the supply side, I would say, is the institution itself was a geographically. Uh, um, demarcated institution. So there was a region, okay, where within that this Mitas institution, you know, existed, you know, and and different communities had to supply this labor, okay. And then there was a region outside of which it was just a line on a map, basically, where they didn't have to do that, okay. So that's the supply side is that there was um, a discontinuity, right? There's a geographic discontinuity in whether this Mitas institution was enforced, okay. Um, and then the uh, I guess the demand side, in some sense, well, the demand side is just sort of the rationale for using this approach is that you, um, when you look, when you want to try and infer the cause, the causal effect of something, you want to come, the ideal is to have treatment and control. The ideal is to compare otherwise identical units. Okay. So think about the 
the vaccine trials, you're, you're comparing otherwise identical people kind of statistic, statistically and giving one person treatment control or sorry, giving one person treatment, one person control. You don't even tell them what it is because if you tell them, then that makes them not comparable. If you know you have a, a, a vaccine versus placebo, you're going to act differently. Okay. So, um, the ideal is always to compare like units. Okay. And so the idea with a discontinuity study, okay, is, um, and this is the next page, I think. Yeah. The, the idea of the discontinuity study is that you actually, if you have a, a line in space, okay. So here I'm, I'm looking this, imagine this black line is the, the boundary between having mitas and not having mitas enforced. Um, you have this discontinuity, but, and you can compare things on either side of the line. Okay. And the rationale is that if you look on either, if, if you're both at some border and you're just, you're two regions that are abutting one another, you probably, you know, unless it's a, a, a river or some cliff or something, I mean, you're probably going to be fairly similar. Okay. It's just that on one side you have policy A and on the other side you have policy B, right? Okay. So the idea is, so here I labeled them countries, but you can think about it. Country A is Mitas enforcement. Country B is not Mitas enforcement. Okay. So yeah. So, but the idea is you, you if you look at um, either side of this discontinuity, in this case it's geographic, then you, you can compare like units. Okay. You can say, okay, well, in this particular picture, um, you, know, you can say, well, A, A, A1 and B1 are basically going to be similar, except A1 has a certain policy and B1 has some other policy. Okay. And we can try and infer that. Okay. And then now it might be the case that like zones one and zones three are different. Okay. Because they have different uh, weather patterns perhaps or something like that. Imagine this is a larger map. Okay. Um, and, and that's fine because we're only comparing, you know, A3 with B3, A2 with B2, A1 with B1. So we're trying to get as sort of micro as we can and compare like units, but just have this one difference, which is the policy in this case. All right. So <clears throat> now there's always questions about how to implement this, right? I think the idea is sound of trying to isolate the, these uh, areas. And so we're only comparing the policy difference. There's always the question of, you know, how big do you make these boxes? Okay. So I just drew these boxes, right? So there's nothing saying how big I made these. Are these the size of a county in the U.S.? Are they the size of a state? Okay. Are they the size of a, a census tract or a city block or something? So it's, it's not clear how big we should make these. If you make them too small, there's going to be like five people on either side and the statistics maybe just won't work out. Okay. If you make them too big, well, then you're going to be, you know, if you compare it, let's say we made them really big then if you compare a person on this side of A1 with this side of B, B1, maybe they're too different because the, the scale, maybe this is, you know, 500 miles on either side, okay? In which case they would be too different and not comparable, okay? So there's a trade-off between statistical power and sort of the validity of this approach. Um, yeah, I mean, there's a bunch of like methods for trying to choose the optimal size, and it's, but again, it's, it's sort of an art um, at the end of the day, okay? So that, that's an approach. Okay, so this is the general approach is called the discontinuity study. Okay. Um, and this picture here, this particular case um, and the application that I'm pushing with this Mitas region is uh, a geographic discontinuity study. Okay. Um, you can do any number of, anytime you have a continuous variable where the outcome is sort of discontinuous, it's, it's, there's a cutoff basically, then you can do this thing. Okay. So in the case of a geographic discontinuity, there's the you know, continuous variable, which is your location in space. And there's the discontinuity at the border, right? The border of the country is a discontinuity where on one side you're in country A and the other side you're in country B. All right. Now, um, <clears throat> you could think about other examples. Okay. So, you know, for instance, a lot of policies kick in at a certain point, right? So tax rates change at certain points, although they try and make them continuous because it creates funky incentives if you don't. Um, but, you know, for instance, uh, uh, certain certain po policies for firms, they'll kick in at like 50 employees. I think for um, the American Affordable Care Act, uh, a lot of the policies about um, employer provided insurance kick in at 50 employees. Okay, so, so there's stuff that kicks in like that and, and there's other stuff that kicks in at certain income levels. Okay, so we're thinking of, you know, more recently about the um, 
bills people are talking about with COVID that they 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 phase out at certain income levels. Okay, so um, you do have instances where you have discontinuities, and and you might say, okay, well, well, you know, this policy, let's say it's a certain tax type of tax rebate or some something like that that kicks in at an income of you know thirty thousand dollars a year, then you could say, well, people that make twenty nine between twenty nine and thirty. We'll look at them and then we'll look at people that make between 30 and 31. They should be similar, other things being equal, right? Uh, it's just that one's getting this, this rebate and one's not. And then if we compare them, we can look generally. Um, so we, we can try and infer that effect, right? But if you just compare people below 30 and people above 30, there's so many different things that are that are going to happen that, that are, you know, just income itself, right, is going to have an influence on you. So um, so that's the idea is that you, you isolate and you compare like to like by focusing in on this discontinuity region, right? Now the question is, do you use 1,000, 2,000, 5,000? I don't know, right? So that's that's where the art comes in, okay? Um, all right, so that, that would be like a income-based, that's a clear case where you would wanna potentially use um, a discontinuity approach, right? Um, you can do other things. So uh, elections are actually a good example where you can use discontinuity because there's a discontinuous outcome, which is the person, well, yeah, okay. In many elections, the person that gets the most votes wins, right? Um, in the, I guess even in the presidential race, it would be electoral votes. But you know, if you look at like a municipal election or anything like that, uh, in, in most, most countries, you know, you're gonna have a threshold at, at, at the, not 50%, but at the plurality of, of, of votes. Okay, so 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 just above that threshold, you know, candidate A is going to win, and just below that threshold, candidate B is going to win. Okay, so that's a case where you can look at this discontinuity. And so, you know, what it tells you though is, uh, you know, the, the the vote. Think about it like a two. Just we always have a two party setup. Okay, and maybe um, you know, uh, some somehow we've classified across different countries, different parties is more left wing or right wing. Okay. You can, so, so you can look at the vote share. Okay. And the vote share, you know, it tells you stuff about a country. I mean, there, there's differences between countries where people are more left wing versus more right wing. Okay. Um, we know that. And, and the, those are confounders. Okay. But if you just look at countries where the vote share was like 49 to 50% for, for say the left wing party, uh, versus 50 to 51 for the left wing party, in which case they, they would have won. Um, then you're you're comparing like to like again, right? So you're looking on uh, the vote share as a proxy for sort of the the sort of left right balance of a country, but then the the discontinuous outcome is whether who actually wins, who's in power, right? Um, and so then you can try and infer what, what what the impact of that is. Okay, so that's another example where you have a discontinuity in this case, the outcome of an election as a function of the vote share, um, and then you can use that or exploit that to to try and compare like units and and infer the effect of the uh, policy positions of the party that's in power or the candidate is that's in power, right? So um, that's another example. So there's a million different examples, okay, where you can you can um, do stuff like that, all right? Uh, and, and try and infer sort of to real causal mechanisms, okay? Um, yeah, so so we're gonna, uh, Jamogul and Robinson are gonna talk more about this, okay? So we're gonna see more of that and we can, uh, we can we can discuss that uh, in greater detail um, as we go. All right. Uh, so I think, I think that's pretty much it as far as um, this causality stuff. Yeah, I mean, um, yeah, I think that's what, that's kind of all I want to say in general. All right. Um, we'll, we'll 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 probably continually touch back on. On, on topics and issues that relate to this though. So it's a good, I think it's a good place to start, all right? So, um, yeah, and I guess, uh, I, I did kind of want to try this, to, to tie this back into some of the solo stuff too, all right? So, um, I did, I did this a little backwards. So the, the stuff that I want to talk about is actually the beginning of this lecture. Now I, I kind of changed the order, okay? But um, remember in solo, uh, we um, let me fire up the iPad real quick here. So in in the in, in the solo model, and I guess this this isn't even really the solo model per se. Um, it's just kind of like the 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 capital accumulation component of that. Okay, so this notion that output is a product of of 
technology, capital, labor, human capital, and stuff like that. Uh, it doesn't matter that you know the, the critical thing for the SOA model is that investment is is some fixed fraction of output. The whole the whole mechanism, the whole production function side though is that's that's just like a, a capital driven growth setup. Okay, so so but but I guess really what I would call, you know this is just sort of like growth accounting stuff, general growth accounting stuff. All right, so and right in that word, it's counting. I mean, it, you're, you're trying to account for what are the reasons for growth, okay? So in the, in the, that's already kind of bumping into this notion of causality, okay? So, um, but but so so I guess yeah. So but 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 the the basic construct though is you know we're gonna have we have some production function, all right? That's we've been assuming you know for a while now. We have some uh, production function now. Uh, you know, if it's just a basic solo model, we we just write the y is equal to f of k and l, right? And and oftentimes, uh, you know, I, I would I guess I I sometimes I wrote z you know, like this, right? So we had like production is z technology times capital times labor. Okay, so that's our Cobb Douglas production function. That's what we've been doing for a while, right? So, um. Yeah, sometimes how you incorporate technology, like I discussed before, it, it can be different from, in different cases, but but that's the general approach. Okay, so um, with this, you know, if, if we let's take this equation, and we we've kind of done stuff like this effectively before, but you know, let's take this equation, and well, I guess actually, I, I wanna I wanna okay, let's let's look at different variants of this equation, and then we can go on to the next step. Okay, so that that was one variant. Okay, remember I introduced human capital at some point. So there, that's where it's like, you know, you have capital, human capital, and labor, okay? And I think, or actually no, sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. I just replaced labor with human capital, I think, when I did before. So so in that case, um, you know, we had some technology, we had capital, and then we just replaced labor with human capital, right? So that, that was like a, the sort of the next step in, in making things more general, okay? And what we said was that human capital was you know, sort of the average level of education H times the total number of people L, right? Okay, which would mean, you know, that Y would be Z K to the alpha HL minus alpha, okay? So that's, um, I, I mean, I think it's good to, I, the reason I want to include the human capital is that it's, it's going to be something we're going to be talking about a lot and we have, some data on it, okay. So it's good to include it, sort of as, as a general matter, all right. Um, so if we have this sort of setup, okay, we can also think about per capita, right? So usually we're going to try and get to make things per capita, all right, just just because it's it's it makes it easier to compare across countries, okay. So we can think about per capita, right? So in that case, you know, we're going to have little well, y is y over l, okay. Um, so in this case, all right, so it's, you know, on the top, we're gonna have Z, K to the alpha. Let's split this up, H to the one minus alpha, L to the one minus alpha, because I just factored that through over L. Um, and and this actually simplifies. Okay, so we're gonna have Z still, right? We'll have K to the alpha, we'll have H to the one minus alpha, and then we'll have K, sorry, not K, L. We'll have L the minus alpha, all right? And then I think, you know, this is basically what we did before, you know, we have y on the left-hand side. We can combine that k to the alpha and l to the minus alpha. So then we're gonna have z k over l to the alpha, right? We can just combine those and then h to one minus alpha, right? And then this, because capital K over capital L is just little lowercase k, Gonna be k to the alpha h to the one minus alpha. Okay, so at the end of the day, right? So the equation is in, in just writing it over again is gonna look like this. This is our per capita equation. Okay, so that just says per capita output is still technology on the front times capital per worker to the alpha, and then like human capital per worker to the one minus alpha. Okay, so when you go to with human capital, when you go to the per capita level, 
you, you, you get basically the same thing. It's just you're combining capital and human capital at the individual level, and that's producing output at the individual level, okay? And the, you know, the reason we can do this is basically because this production function here up top is, is constant returns to scale. So we can talk about things fully at the individual level. Okay, if there were, if it wasn't constant returns to scale, you, you know, how big your country is is important, right? Because it, it you know, you're gonna have either increasing or decreasing returns, okay, and, and it, things get more complicated. But in this world, we can actually just simply write things at a per capita level, all right? So, yeah. So then, it, and now in terms of why, why do I say growth accounting? Okay, so from here we can we can also think about things in terms of growth rates. Okay, so take this equation up here, all right, and apply our, our growth rate rules. Okay, so when I think about like GY, all right, so that's gonna be GZ plus that growth rate of K to the alpha, which is alpha GK, and then the growth rate of that third term, which is one minus alpha GH, okay? So that's if we, we we're gonna use the, basically the product rule and the power rule, all right? And we're gonna get a growth rate version of that per capita output equation. Okay, and that's, um, th this is really where we can start thinking about growth accounting, okay? So the idea is that we see a certain amount of growth in output. Okay, we can measure this in the data, GY, output per capita, it's pretty easy, we'll do it. Uh, we can see growth in, in the level of capital, we, that's another thing we, we just kinda can measure. Okay, that's a little hard, but we can do it. Uh, we can basically measure human capital, not perfectly, but we can try, all right? So we can measure those three things, but then the thing we really can't measure, which is sort of amorphous, is GZ, okay? So this is like a, what's called the, the solo residual sometimes, okay? So this is something that we can't, we can see technology. I mean, we know, we know technology happens. We can measure, we can kind of look at it and, and talk about it and, you know, see the number of patents that firms are taking out, how much hard need they're spending, but we don't really see the output directly, okay? So, so this is inevitably GZ is only inferred, okay? So we can say, well, there was a ton of growth. There wasn't that much change in capital and human capital, so something must have changed. And in some sense, it must have been like technology or policy or some, some other factor change, okay? So in some sense, this is a potentially many things combined into one, but it's just like, what's the unexplained part of growth that we can't explain with just capital and, and education, okay? And that, that's what GZ is, okay? So, so it's, that's why it's sometimes called this residual. Um, okay, so that, that's how people think about growth accounting. Okay, so um, I guess I'm, I'm out of time and I wanna give you guys a minute to fire up that Mars landing. Um, but that's what we're gonna do next time. Okay, so we're gonna, uh, we're gonna talk about how to, how to think about this, how to bring it to data, it, certain issues of causality and, and so on and so on. Okay, um, awesome. All right, so I'll see you guys next week then. And have a good one. Enjoy that Mars landing.